3.1%. I'm a figures kind of person, so I like that number. But I'd like you to hold on to it, because I'll come back to it. I want to tell you a story about my leadership journey. I'm going to tell you the story as it revolves around three pivotal years of my life. The first year I want to talk to you about is 1983, survival. 1983 was the year that I moved with my parents and my siblings to live in Ghana. Prior to 1983, I was a little girl growing up in northwest London, where I had been born. And like most little children of African parents in London, I was fascinated by their stories, their nostalgic stories of their lives growing up in, for in, in Africa, but in the context of my parents in Ghana. And it seemed like all their friends uh, and, and relatives seem to share this same nostalgic, positive excitement and warmth every time they talked about Ghana. And for me, living in London, the prospect of permanent sunshine, plus all this nostalgia meant only one thing. This place has got to be paradise. I couldn't wait to have my day in paradise. But before we got to 1983, my father got a job in Nigeria, and so we ended up moving to Nigeria first, two years before. And I was in um, school in Nigeria, and like most children of the time, I had a Ghanaian teacher who thought that I should know everything about Ghana because I was from Ghana. It also represented the fact that there was a huge influx of Ghanaians in Nigeria at the time. So in 1983, the Nigerian government asked all Ghanaians to leave. It was a fascinating experience for me, how you get told to leave. And you'd be walking down the street and your Nigerian neighbor would say, Hey, Omo Ghana, you know go-go. So we had to pack our bags, and we arrived in Ghana. And I say I probably was one of the more fortunate who hadn't, didn't have to drive from um, Lagos or Lagos to Accra in those really huge trucks that carried people. 1983 was a year when the rains had failed in Ghana. And so there was a drought, and food was scarce. In addition to a lack of food, a million mouths, including mine, descended on Ghana from Nigeria. It was a difficult experience. It wasn't a matter of whether you had money or not. It was a question of, could you find the food to buy? You know, kenke, as some of you may know, is a staple food in southern Ghana. And at the time, people were willing to buy raw, uncooked kenke to take home and boil for themselves, just to have the assurance that they'd get hold of it. And to buy bread, you needed to know the right people. And so having parents who had been gone from Ghana for so long, and my parents, in addition, were not even city people before they left Ghana, we didn't know these right people who provide bread. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was a traumatic experience. I'm glad I can say it with a smile and laugh. But it was a traumatic experience, to the start, a stark contrast to the life that I had become accustomed to. And in that time, I learned something. I learned and I experienced the life of the average African child. I learned that sometimes life is about survival. I learned to survive. And the good news today is that African countries, at least we know better than some, we don't expect, expe expel each other any longer. Nigeria expelled Ghanaians because apparently Ghanaians had done the same previously. So it was a tit for tat, but we've moved on from that. And that's a good thing. But what hasn't changed for most African children is the experience of survival. For most of them, they have to hope to get access to 
relatively decent health care to survive their childhood. And then if they survive that childhood, they might be lucky to get access to some form of education, education that will feed them with information but won't necessarily challenge their thinking. And then if they're lucky and they're one of the fortunate ones, they may, their parents may be able to put food on the table every single day. And after all of that, of that hassle through life, they might just maybe get a decent job. 1983 was when I started learning to survive. And I spent a decade in Ghana in that period. And thankfully, Ghana made steady progress, and we didn't starve any longer after that. But I learned the lessons of survival, which informed my journey going forward um, back to the UK to study, to finish my um, higher education and become an engineer. But that hunger never left me. I was always searching, always looking for how I was going to go back and do something about that situation that I know that some African child is still living. In 2008, is the year that I believe my leadership journey truly began. And in that year, I managed to get a job in a telecommunications company. And with my children and my family, we moved back to Ghana. We moved to Ghana to work in a role where I could um, influence, I thought, what went on and be part of a positive transformational journey. How wrong could I have been? Sometimes we feel that just our presence by showing up, we have you know, a, wand, a wand and we're just going to wave it and push, push, push. Everything's going to work out and turn out beautifully. It didn't work like that, and I was so frustrated. I complained about everything. People don't show up on time. Things don't work. They're too lazy. Can't they see that we have to do this together? And so I set about challenging myself, trying to understand why I felt so challenged as part of this change journey. And I remember a conversation I had with um, a, um, a driver in our company. And I was trying to draw out of him, as I did with other people, what is it, what is it about what I'm trying to say and do that people don't get? And he said to me, he said, Madame, if you want to change anything for people, you need to get into the gutter with them. And I thought, wow, for all my years of experience and learning and thinking I know what to do, he has probably taught me my most important leadership lesson. We can't create change from the outside in. Change doesn't happen through spectators. Change happens from the inside out. At least if you want it to be sustainable change, you've got to be part and understand the lives that people live to change them inside out. Understanding their walk, understanding what makes their lives what they are so that you can change with them. And that is where change is happening in Africa today, where people are willing to drive the change from within. 2010. In 2010, I learned what it means to inspire people. But I learned in a very long-winded way. My company asked me to go and work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And for those of you who really understand how things work in Africa, I know the whole world thinks that Africa is this blob, but in reality, it's 54 different countries, and everyone has had a slightly different experience, whether it's independence, whether it's you know, subtleties of culture, food we eat, what we do, or what we persistently see in the media. So the prospect of going to DRC was an opportunity for me to get an even bigger job as the chief marketing officer of my company. But everybody, anybody who thought they cared about me said, please, please, Whatever you do, don't go to the DRC. And then when I insisted, which people thought maybe she's just an obstinate, she's like, okay, you can go, but leave the children. Why? Don't people live in the DRC? Aren't there things happening in the DRC? So I went. I went to the DRC. Not only did I go, but I also took my children with me. And while working in the DRC, I met an inspired young man an inspired Congolese young man who had never left the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
He had had all his education in the DRC, and he came to me at the time in our company and asked for an opportunity. You see, at that time, he was working in IT security. And I don't know whether anybody in this room knows this secret, but I have found the DRC to be one of the most innovative um, places in the whole of Africa, particularly when it comes to um, technology and IT. But he asked me to be put in charge of a new revenue stream that we had. And that revenue stream was what we call data. Today, it's what encompasses all things um, um, internet. But it was data. And I said to him, well, I'm willing to give you the opportunity, but you're still going to have to do your IT security job, and you're going to have to um, also do this new job. And he, he was absolutely fine by it. He embraced the opportunity to prove himself. And in embracing that opportunity to improve himself, he pushed himself. To prove himself, he pushed himself. And in pushing himself, he delivered phenomenal results. In business, we like to see graphs that go upwards. I'm doing that way because hopefully it's the right way for you. Um, his graph was exponential, literally. His inspiration met with opportunity. And he has since gone on to work in many countries, in Senegal, in Ghana, and inspired many young people on the continent. Every time I see him, every time I speak to him, I know that he's one of the pivotal people in our readiness and our, prep our drive in the digital age across Africa. So when you've been through all of this and you've seen all that... Um, Africa has to offer, it makes you think a bit more about Africa. It makes you think about what is our hope and ambition for Africa. You see, for too long, the goal has been to eliminate poverty. Why is that a goal? How can the elimination of poverty be actually called a goal? Are we trying to make people attain a certain level that we expect is acceptable, or what, are we trying to make things a little better from where they are today? Let me put it another way. I like running. I'm not um, a sprinter. I like to run long distances. But I think the best analogy comes from running. When you're running a 100-meter race, are you running away from the start line, or are you running to the finish line? They're not the same thing. Or, if you go to a village where there's no water, is the provision of a borehole the end game or an interim solution? Why can't the ambition be to provide a sustainable water supply system that not only improves healthcare but the economic outcome of that village? Why is the perspective that a little better is okay, acceptable, when what we should be aiming for is what everybody else deserves, any human being on the planet deserves? And so I believe that we need to focus on creating prosperity for Africa. And when I say prosperity, our, our ambition should be to change life in Africa from survival to thrive, thriving. People need to be given the opportunity to, to thrive, enjoy life, and do all the wonderful things that we think that people should do, that we deserve to do. And to do that, we need a bit more than what is talked about and what is seen today. We need a new normal. We need a new normal that changes what Africa is today, a new normal that is bold, a new normal that is confident, a new normal that doesn't clap for a borehole, it just says, tick, what's next? A new normal that says having decent health care isn't a nice to have. It's a fundamental necessity that we can work for. Because we have the resources for it, but we haven't decided to do it yet. That's what we need to work towards. A bold new normal, 3.1%. Hopefully, I've had you guessing for a while what that figure is. Well, the good news is that 3.1% is very close to Russia's 
GDP in 2015. Russia's GDP in 2015 was 3.3%, actually. 3.3% of global GDP um, was Russia, 3.3%. 3.1% is actually the GDP of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa in 2015, our share of global GDP. 3.1% is our share of global GDP that's supposed to support 1 billion sub-Saharan Africans. Is the share of global GDP that's supposed to support 14% of the world's population. I don't think I need to say much more. You get the picture. The math isn't right. The math isn't right. And for me, the next time someone talks about rising, please tell them humbly from me that that's not enough. That that pat on the shoulder about a little um, growth is insufficient that our goals and ambitions are much bigger and greater than that, that we're bold and we're confident about the future. And I tell you why. I tell you why because in five years from now, according to the IMF, our GDP contribution to the world will grow to a whopping 3.2%. <laughs> wow! We're going to rise from 3.1 to 3. Oh, we deserve a round of applause, I'm sorry. We, we're, just, we're just really it. 3.2% and 1.1 billion people is not ambition for me. You see, Africa has taught me to be ambitious, to lead, to thrive, to drive. Africa hasn't taught itself enough of the lessons it's taught me. We need to teach Africa the lessons it teaches us because everybody in this room has been taught by Africa. Everybody has goals, dreams, and ambitions that are much greater than what the world expects of Africa. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to change mindsets. Not just our own, but the mindsets of every single person who can't we come across, whether they're African or not, what they think of Africa. And we're going to change mindsets by changing our language, right? Please don't let anybody patronize you with rising ever again. Because it's the kind of language that says, a little more for you is good enough, and it's not. And so we will change our language and speak about the big and great things that other people speak about, because we too have an amazing continent that has everything that it takes to actually be probably the wealthiest. Right? We have a river in the DRC, the Congo River, that can actually provide enough power for pretty much the whole continent and beyond. I could go on all night, but the truth of the matter is it's our decision around our boldness and confidence that is required. And, once we, and, to, and to be able to change that language that we speak, we have to change our vision. Our view has to change. We change our vision, what we hope for, we change our language, and that changes mindsets. And so, I think we can all come to a, co a common agreement. That what we really want is a new normal. A new normal of an Africa where everyone prospers. Not as a right, but because they can and they should. And we will be part of that today and always. Thank you.